Chapter Three, Section Three of Capital, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Ferreri. Capital: A Critical Analysis of Capitalist Production, Volume One, by Karl Marx. Translated from the Third German Edition by Samuel Moore and Edward Aveling, and edited by Frederick Engels. Part One: Commodities and Money. Chapter Three: Money or the Circulation of Commodities. Section Three: Money. C. Universal Money. When money leaves the home sphere of circulation, it strips off the local garbs which it there assumes of a standard of prices, of coin, of tokens, and of a symbol of value, and returns to its original form of bullion. In the trade between the markets of the world, the value of commodities is expressed so as to be universally recognized. Hence, their independent value form also, in these cases, confronts them under the shape of universal money. It is only in the markets of the world that money acquires to the full extent the character of the commodity whose bodily form is also the immediate social incarnation of human labor in the abstract. Its real mode of existence in this sphere adequately corresponds to its ideal concept. Within the sphere of home circulation, there can be but one commodity which, by serving as the measure of value, becomes money. In the markets of the world, a double measure of value holds sway: gold and silver. Footnote fifty-nine. The opponents themselves of the mercantile system, a system which considered the settlement of surplus trade balances in gold and silver as the aim of international trade, entirely misconceived the functions of money of the world. I have shown by the example of Ricardo in what way their false conception of the laws that regulate the quantity of the circulating medium is reflected in their equally false conception of the international movement of the precious metals. His erroneous dogma, quote, "an unfavorable balance of trade never arises but from a redundant currency; the exportation of the coin is caused by its cheapness, and is not the effect but the cause of an unfavorable balance." End quote. Already occurs in Barbon. Quote, the balance of trade, if there be one, is not the cause of sending away the money out of a nation, but that proceeds from the difference of the value of bullion in every country. End quote. McCulloch, in the Literature of Political Economy, a classified catalogue, London, 1845, praises Barbon for this anticipation, but prudently passes over the naive forms in which Barbon clothes the absurd supposition on which the currency principle is based. The absence of real criticism and even of honesty in that catalogue culminates in the sections devoted to the history of the theory of money. The reason is that McCulloch in this part of the work is flattering Lord Overstone, whom he calls Facile Princeps Argentinorum. End footnote. Money of the world serves as the universal medium of payment, as the universal means of purchasing, and as the universally recognized embodiment of all wealth. Its function as a means of payment in the settling of international balances is its chief one. Hence the watchword of the mercantilists, balance of trade. Gold and silver serve as international means of purchasing chiefly and necessarily in those periods when the customary equilibrium in the interchange of products between different nations is suddenly disturbed. And lastly, it serves as the universally recognized embodiment of social wealth, whenever the question is not of buying or paying, but of transferring wealth from one country to another, and whenever this transference in the form of commodities is rendered impossible, either by special conjunctures in the markets, or by the purpose itself that is intended. Footnote 60. For instance, in subsidies, money loans for carrying on wars, or for enabling banks to resume cash payments, etc., it is the money form, and no other, of value that may be wanted. End footnote. Just as every country needs a reserve of money for its home circulation, so too it requires one for external circulation in the markets of the world. The functions of hoards, therefore, arise in part out of the function of money, as the medium of the home circulation and home payments, and in part out of its function of money in the world. Footnote 62. L'argent se partage entre les nations relativement à besoin qu'elles en ont. 
étant toujours attiré par les productions, that is, the mines which are continually giving gold and silver do give sufficient to supply such a needful balance to every nation. End footnote. For this latter function, the genuine money commodity, actual gold and silver, is necessary. On that account, Sir James Stewart, in order to distinguish them from their purely local substitutes, calls gold and silver money of the world. The current of the stream of gold and silver is a double one. On the one hand, it spreads itself from its sources over all the markets of the world, in order to become absorbed, to various extents, into the different national spheres of circulation, to fill the conduits of currency, to replace abraded gold and silver coins, to supply the material of articles of luxury, and to petrify into hoards. Footnote 63. Exchanges rise and fall every week, and at some particular times in the year run high against a nation, and at other times run as high on the contrary. End footnote. This first current is started by the countries that exchange their labor, realized in commodities, for the labor embodied in the precious metals by gold and silver producing countries. On the other hand, there is a continual flowing backwards and forwards of gold and silver between the different national spheres of circulation, a current whose motion depends on the ceaseless fluctuations in the course of exchange. Footnote 64. These various functions are liable to come into dangerous conflict with one another, whenever gold and silver have also to serve as a fund for the conversion of banknotes. End footnote. Countries in which the bourgeois form of production is developed to a certain extent limit the hoards concentrated in the strong rooms of the banks to the minimum required for the proper performance of their peculiar functions. Footnote 65. What money is more than of absolute necessity for a home trade is dead stock, and brings no profit to that country it's kept in, but as it is transported in trade, as well as imported. What if we have too much coin? We may melt down the heaviest and turn it out into the splendor of plate, vessels, or utensils of gold and silver, or send it out as a commodity, where the same is wanted or desired, or let it out at interest, where interest is high. Money is but the fat of the body politic, whereof too much cloth as often hinder its agility as too little makes it sick, as fat lubricates the motion of the muscles, feeds in want of victuals, fills up the uneven cavities and beautifies the body. So cloth money in the state quicken its action, feeds from abroad in time of dearth at home, evens accounts, and beautifies the whole, although more especially the particular persons that have it in plenty. End footnote. Whenever these hordes are strikingly above their average level, it is, with some exceptions, an indication of stagnation in the circulation of commodities, of an interruption in the even flow of their metamorphoses. End of Part 1, Chapter 3, Section 3C three